Well, it's pretty straightforward to classify threats that you already know about, like viruses, trojans, uh, worms, rootkits. These traditional types of threats are quite easy to mitigate, because we know about them and because we can detect them automatically, using some sort of signature. So we call them known threats. Well, unfortunately, this is not enough anymore. We've said in our previous videos that unfortunately signature detection is not enough anymore. Because currently the level of sophistication and complexity in attacks has increased so much that now we have to identify them not just by some signature but also by looking at their behavior. So instead of relying on a signature, we observe what that piece of malware actually tries to do, uh, creates some processes, changes files, encrypts documents, opens connections. Nevertheless, this is what we call unknown threats. An unknown threat is probably not going to be detected by standard signature-based tools. It simply does not match any signature for, let's say, two possible reasons. Either because it's advanced enough to look like legitimate traffic, like a normal application, uh, with some normal behavior, or it is able to hide itself so well that scanning engines don't catch it, or even it infects the scanning engines themselves, or the system calls that they're using to scan. Or because it's very new, which sometimes is called a zero-day vulnerability or threat. It means that the software vendor is either not aware of the vulnerability just yet, or it is aware of it, but it doesn't have a fix for it. Either way, a zero day is a vulnerability without a patch or a solution. And it's called a zero day not just on the first day, but until the company develops a patch for it. Keep in mind, for the exam, that the term zero day usually refers to the vulnerability, but sometimes it can refer to the attack that exploits it as well. The Port Swigger website has a nice listing of some known zero days currently out there. You can be absolutely sure that there are many, many more zero days out there, but we haven't found out about them yet. And you might wonder, why is that? Why don't people publish this stuff if it's uh, so dangerous? Well, because a zero day vulnerability can have a huge financial value. Just imagine if you were the only one knowing about a vulnerability in the latest version of Apple's iOS or in some widely used banking software around the world. How much damage could you do? Or how much money would someone be willing to pay for this zero-day exploit? For the exam, you should be aware of this, uh, I would say a bit weird classification, based on knowledge. It's also called the Johari window, which basically covers the four combinations between things that are known or unknown by us or by the rest of the world. Uh, this Johari window is sometimes connected to a well-known, <laughs> pun intended, uh, speech from uh, US Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, who said something like this. So mainly he referred to known knowns when we know about the threat we understand it we know what to do about it we just have to act then known unknowns when we are aware of the threat but we don't understand it completely like when we know that we should secure software development against something like uh, sql injections but the programmers don't know how to do it then we have unknown knowns. These are things that we could understand, but we are not aware of. That is knowledge that you don't know that it exists. This is uh, similar to the zero day that someone else discovers in your software. And then we have unknown unknowns, when you don't even know how little you know. Does this make any sense? <laughs> For example, attacks that you are not even aware that they exist. I would say this reflects uh, one of the diseases of the social aspect of the internet, where everyone has a strong opinion, regardless how little they know about the topic. Anyway, remember the Joe Hardy window for the exam. Have fun understanding it. Just don't bring it up at parties. But one thing that we can get from this story is the topic of bug bounties. 
These are programs that reward with real money those security researchers that manage to identify and submit vulnerabilities in the software products of a company. Basically, this is a method for companies that address that part of the uh, Johari window where they try to get to know what they currently don't know. So it's like a company one day says, we don't know what vulnerabilities we have, but we will pay anyone who can find some for us so we can fix them. This website here is uh, not the only one, but has a nice list of current bounties paid by a lot of companies to anyone who manages to find a vulnerability and report it back to the company and doesn't try to exploit it or sell it on the dark web. With so many unknowns and advanced threats that we cannot match with simple signatures, we can still use threat intelligence to try to find out as much as we can, and one of those things that we can find out more about is the behavior of specific types of attackers. The first one is APT. It's a bit of a weird term in my opinion, because by definition APT refers to the continuous ability of a hacker or a group to compromise systems, to obtain and also maintain access, also known as establishing persistence. Lockheed Martin introduced this term and they said that A stands for advanced, which means it's targeted, coordinated, uh, purposeful, it might use some custom tools that we haven't seen before. Uh, P is persistent, which means that the intrusion is designed to remain undetected for months, even years sometimes. And T stands for threat. This is the person or the group that has a malicious intent. It also has the opportunity to do it and also has the capability to execute it. You can have a look over the list from a FireEye of currently known and self-identified APT hacker groups all over the world. Their methods often don't have much in common, they also develop custom tools and attack methods that make them very hard to detect and eliminate. Also, in order to ensure that persistence that we mentioned, attacks carried out by APT groups usually are very good at removing all their traces, so that in many cases the attacks themselves are never detected while they are carried out. We only find out about them much later from the media when some confidential documents are leaked or uh, data breaches with personal information or source code is, uh, is published. One exam tip here. For some reason CompTIA assumes that an APT always refers to well-funded groups of hackers, with lots of resources perhaps receiving support from uh, governments. But from my experience and from what the other security vendors are saying, normally APTs are just about those attacks that gain access to your network, maintain it undetected, usually for a long period of time, and they probably steal some data. Do you need government resources or to be very well funded to do this in real life? Well, no, just some skill and perhaps some luck in finding a weak target. I'm mentioning this because other vendors think this way too. If you see APTs outside the exam, think about persistent malware, period. Not necessarily uh, Russian hackers influencing US elections, okay? Another category is organized crime. Just like organized crime outside the digital realm, cyber criminals are usually focused on fraud, financial gain, or to put it simply, it's about stealing stuff, money or valuable data. Sometimes it might even be motivated by some sort of revenge, but mostly they do it for financial gain. A subcategory here would be the cyber terrorist, which although sounds like a virus infected Robocop, cyber terrorists are hackers that do harm without financial gain. Or in the words of Alfred, some men just want to watch the world burn. Hacktivists are another type that does not seek financial gain. An example would be groups like Anonymous, which you might have heard about in the media. They are driven by moral justice, if you were to ask them. <laughs> they promote some political agenda, they want to make statements which usually imply a strong disagreement with some government or corporate decision, so it's basically a form of digital protest. Their behavior is usually focused on stealing and publishing sensitive data, defacing websites, uh, which is replacing the front page of some government entity or company with their own political message, and executing denial of service attacks to take down specific uh, websites. Nation-states are attackers that are state-sponsored. Many countries have them, 
They are used for military advantage, sometimes even commercial gain. And you can probably guess that the nation states are strongly connected with APTs, especially if we think about them like CompTIA does, that they are very well funded and they have the support of some uh, foreign government. I know that most people when hearing about this description would think about North Korea, China, Russia, but if you remember the NSA documents published on Wikileaks, they proved that the NSA was in the possession of a lot of zero days and the companies involved knew nothing about them. So yeah, everybody does it. Nation state attackers are dangerous from one additional point of view. You should understand that people that work for governments and perform such activities inside their own minds, they are patriots. They do not think that they are doing anything wrong. On the contrary, they think they are doing justice. Script kiddies. It might sound less threatening or even insulting, but <laughs> script kiddies are not kids. They are people just like you and I who might be beginner hackers, might just want to attack some systems for fun or just to see how it works. They don't have the knowledge or the skills for hacking. They don't understand exactly how the attack or the exploit works. They just grab the tools, the scripts for a specific attack and they run them. So it's just like a couple of kids who found a remote control toy car and started playing with it without caring about how the electrical engine works or when the batteries will run out. They sound inoffensive, but they're still dangerous by the way. Those tools might be easy to use, but they are made by real hackers and they work. They might not be the latest and the greatest, but they still can do a lot of damage, especially against older and unpatched systems. Recreational hackers are not considered dangerous, at least as long as they do it for recreational purposes. Which by the way covers hacking competitions, uh, capture the flag, uh, security contests, hackathons. We still need to watch out for them because they have real skills and they might just decide one day to do an episode of Hackers Gone Wild and do something nasty. Professional hackers are people who work as penetration testers or security auditors. They can be hired and they don't act with malicious intent, but under a contractual agreement. Security researchers that attempt to find vulnerabilities and report them immediately also fall into this category. Suicide hackers. <laughs> you might see them on the exam or you might not. They're not exactly a specific type of hacker as much as a specific type of uh, person. <laughs> Which is a person that has nothing to lose. Commits illegal acts, data theft, destroys systems or data and does not care if they are caught. They even assume that they will be caught at some point, hence the term suicide, but they only want to reach their goals by any means. So these are desperate hackers living in desperate times. And just in case you're wondering, no, a group of suicide hackers doesn't make a suicide squad. The insider threat, that's your colleague right next to you, who someday might decide to attack the company. Your colleague is much more dangerous because he or she already has access to some systems. Which also means that even if we have the best perimeter defense, it does not matter anymore, it's completely useless against an attacker that's already inside our network and that we already trust. So why would your colleague do it? Well, they might be angry with the company, they might think of stealing some money by changing some financial records, uh, maybe they were bribed by a competitor to steal some secrets, or maybe they were threatened. Insider threats can also be unintentional. Even employees using weak passwords can be an internal threat. But also a threat can come from uh, shadow IT. It sounds kind of ominous, but it's far from it. Shadow IT means integrating devices or software or cloud services into the company without the knowledge of IT or not included in any security policy. To give you a few examples, mobile devices, hidden switches or wireless access points under the desks, uh, cloud services. For example, admins deciding that one day that the company's storage infrastructure is too complicated to use. So they decide to store all their configuration backups, keys, certificates in something like Dropbox. Who monitors Dropbox? Who manages access to that storage? Well, nobody. And <laughs> that's why it's called shadow IT. Former employees can also be internal threats, especially if they have retained some access due to a badly conducted offboarding process. Maybe IT or HR simply forgot to revoke their access. Or they could just know some information that can cause damage. 
Just an exam tip here, CompTIA really likes to address insider threats in their exams, so always try to keep them in mind when looking for threat actors. Another useful exam concept is commodity malware. So what is it? Well, it's malware, so it's bad code. Malicious software, right, and it's commodity because it's available to you, to me, to everyone. Well, if it's so popular and so well known and everybody knows what to look for, then we should be able to identify it um, easily with any antivirus, right? And yes, we can detect them easily, so why does it still matter? Well, it matters because it's the most common type of malware. It's basically what 99% of the time we call malware. And it's still so dangerous because a lot of computers and people out there don't use any kind of antivirus and use old, outdated, unpatched, end-of-life systems and software. And they can still fall victim to these common attacks. So how do you get some malware if it's so easy? If you want to play with some of these well-known viruses, trojans, uh, crypto lockers, have a look over this link. It's not the only link, of course, but beware, this is live malware code. Download and use at your own risk. You can also find the link in the video description. Or you can create your own malware with something like the Empire Project tool. Now, don't think that this tool will actually create a complete new piece of malware. It's still using some templates, so you're not getting away undetected. You can find it on GitHub and you can run it in a Docker container. Also the link in the description. Or you can buy it from the dark web. And no, I'm not going to give you the link this time, so I'll just give you this nice article that explains the dark web uh, better than I can. So, if it's not commodity malware, then it's probably some custom malware, right? Like those used in APT attacks. But don't think that commodity malware is used only by hackers with limited resources. Oftentimes, APT groups will begin an attack, especially in the reconnaissance phase, using commodity malware, some well-known tools so that they won't be as easily identified. Then, while everyone is looking at some insignificant malware, they would bring out the big custom guns. Alright, so for the exam, be sure to remember the types of threats that we've talked about and the different types of nasty attackers that might be after your data. Keep in mind that they do have different types of expertise as hackers, but also different reasons for being those bad guys. And that's it about threat actors and threat classification. Don't forget to subscribe and see you on the next video.